Today, our focus is on designing of riveted joints. And after that, we're going to talk about um, the design of welded joints. Now, both are important, but they apply differently depending on the nature of a design, the nature of a joint that you want or what you want to achieve. So that's why we need to discuss each of them. And later on, we'll also talk about the merits and demerits of each of these. That can also help us in making a decision as to which type of joint we want for a particular component. So the, when you're trying to join two pieces of metal, you can lap them around where you put one joint over the other and then drill a hole then plant a rivet. That is an option we have. So you can have what is known as a, of course we're saying that here the plates overlap for a lap joint. Then one, what we're going to call a single riveted lap joint. That's a lap joint which is made of a single row of rivets. And the other one which has a double row, point, uh, uh, it's going to have two rows of rivets. Triple three, just like that. Then in a back joint, this is where the, the joints, the metals that you're putting together come in contact. They actually touch each other by the ends. Now for a riveted joint, it means that you end up putting another layer of material on top, which is conjoining the two ends or the two materials, and then you drill out holes and start punching out the rivets. In riveting terminology, there are some important terms that we use there. The commonest of them is the pitch. As traditionally, just as we like referring to it, the pitch is supposed to be the distance from the center of one rivet to the center of the next rivet within the same row, within the same line, from the center to the center. Others say from one rivet to the one point on a rivet to the corresponding point on the next rivet. But this is more specific because that becomes open-ended and quite a bit ambiguous. Unless you're dealing with um, something that has special features like maybe a thread or something. But for a rivet, from the center of one rivet to the center of the next in the same row gives us that pitch. Then we also have what is known as the gauge line. This one is just a line of rivets parallel to the direction of the stress. Meaning you may be given, you may have a scenario where you know the direction where the stress is acting. The nominal diameter, this is the diameter of a rivet before they're driven into the hole that, that is where they, they, they will end up. Mostly, we don't use this for calculation purposes. We prefer to use the gross diameter of a rivet. So, when you say the gross diameter of a rivet, that is the diameter of the rivet hole. Because after punching a hole into, I mean a rivet into a hole, it fills out that space completely. So hence the basis for those calculations. Then the edge distance, that is where we are trying to talk about the distance from the edge of a member to between the, the, the edge of a member to the nearest rivet in there, or where the rivet is sitting, it could be in a hole or where we've seen the rivet. Then the repeating section, we're talking about a group of rivets whose pattern repeats itself along the length of the joint. Then the gauge distance, distance between two consecutive rivets. Then the back pitch, the distance between the center lines of the or two rows of rivets. This one means that you have here and there, you are looking at the distance between them. It gives you that row to the other one. So then you have hmm, the, the so-called back pitch so far. What may cause a rivet to fail or a riveted joint to fail? So there's, first of all, what is known as tearing off. 
tearing off is one failure that may happen along the pitch line of your river toss. So to for this type of failure, the force that is responsible, the force or the tearing force that may happen can be calculated by multiplying the stress by the corresponding area. So this is the tearing stress. And here we we'll subtract pitch minus the diameter of the rivet. So P minus D multiplied by the thickness, then multiplied by the tearing stress. Then the other mode of failure is by shearing off of the rivets, where the rivets just shear off along their cross section. Then you see the joint failing. To determine this, to determine the, the this one, the force responsible for that is PS is equal to N by this squared shear over four. Where the small n there is representing the number of rivets per pitch length. How many rivets are fitting there gives us our small n. Then, of course, PS, we know that's the, the sharing strength per pitch length. If you're dealing with a double cover butt joint, then it means we are going to multiply by two. That is covered. Then we can also have failure due to the bearing pressure between the rivet and the plate. In this case, this is the one we sometimes prefer to call the crushing pressure. So we have the crushing stress multiplied by the diameter of the rivet multiplied by the thickness of that material you're dealing with. And then that is the number of hmm, uh, rivets per pitch length. Then what about a failure due to the sharing of the plate between the edge and the rivet hole? Here, multiply 1.5. I mean, just make sure you keep 1.5 multiplied by the diameter of the rivet hole or the diameter of the rivet. Then you could you will manage to get rid of that failure mode. And what about the failure of a joint due to splitting between the holes and the edge of the plate? So there, it means maybe they were too close. So that's where we again go back and use the same principle. We'll ensure that you keep 1.5 times the rivet diameter, the distance that is between the center of the rivets and the edge of the plates. Then you are going to get rid of this failure. So for these, it means that before you can even employ, before you can even leave it, you carry out those measurements. And once you are satisfied, then you are going to get rid of this mode of failure. As we practice, sorry, we can also talk about the efficiency. How do you find the efficiency of such a joint? The efficiency is given by the list of all these, the list of either of these, the smallest number of them. But when we calculate them, we'll try to say it's the maximum or it's the biggest of them. The list of either the tearing load, the shearing load, or the crushing load, divided by the product of pitch, by thickness of the material, by the tearing stress. So there, we ensure that you express it as a percentage, then we're good to go. Now, here's our question for this. We have two plates, 50 millimeters thick, joined together by double riveted lap joint. And then the pitch in each row of rivets is 60 millimeters. The rivet diameter is 20 millimeters. If the allowable stresses are shear stress 94.5, tearing stress 150 megapascals, crushing stress 212.5 meganewtons per square meter. Calculate what we need to calculate now the maximum tensile force per pitch length, then the efficiency of the joint. What we are calling the maximum the tensile force is actually the list of all the three, as you will see. So what I've loaded here, what I've listed here is basically just 
the, the information that we have here, starting with the shear stress, the tearing stress, our shear stress was 94.5 by 10 power 6. Our tearing stress was 150 times 10 power 6 as well. Then we also have the crushing stress, which was 212.2 by 10 power 6. Diameter of the rivet, this is, a, this is our gross diameter of tradition, 0 0.02. Then the pitch, 0 0.06, because it was 60 millimeters. Then the thickness of the plates involved, 15 millimeters, which is now 0 0.015. As usual, these must be meters. So these, whatever you see millimeters, we're dividing by 1,000. So hence we got 0 0.02. We had 60 divided by 1,000, we got 0 0.06. We had 15 millimeters here, divided by 1,000, we got 0 0.015, just like that. So this is how this was interpreted. Then let's get to the first one, the maximum tensile force per pitch length. So first things first, the resistance against steering of the plate or tearing force, this is the one who said RT is equal to PT given by the difference between pitch and diameter multiplied by the thickness and the tearing stress. Pitch is 0 0.06. Diameter of the rivets, which is the gross diameter, 0 0.02. Thickness of the plates, 0 0.015. The tearing stress, 150 multiplied by 10 raised to power 6. From this calculation, we get 90,000. Then the next one is the resistance against shearing of the rivets or, or allowable shear force. So here we have PS, RS is N by the squared uh, shear stress over 4, N times 2, or times 1. So here, this is our 2 by as you see, even, even where we're going, we're saying having two the pitch length, each pitch length normally accommodates two of them. Two times pi squared times and 4.5 times 10 power 6, everything divided by 4, and we get 59, 376.101. Then we also have resistance against crushing of the rivets or crushing strength. RC, PC, so PC, PC, it's just a repetition there. N, DT, stress C. So the number of rivets, the pitch length by the diameter of the rivets, by the thickness of the rivets, multiplied by the crushing stress. So our N is 2, D, 0 0.02, uh, T, 0 0.015, and the crushing stress was 212.5 by 10 power 6. From there, we get 127,500. Now, our emphasis here is that the 127,5, the 127,500, if you compare the numbers, I have 127,500. This is the biggest of them. I have 59,000. I also have 90,000. So here, I'm not going to pick the maximum value as the question was asking. I'm going to pick the list of them. The list load is the one I'm going to pick, which is this. So here I'm talking about which is the least permissible force that I need here. It is 59, 376.101. This is the, the, the one we're looking for. But then, once you've gotten this, you are now ready to find this, the, the efficiency. So getting to the efficiency, we said it's supposed to be list of either of these. We're not saying that 
In the formula, you can now substitute one, two, three. List of any, which of them is the least among us the three? We already established this, that is 59376.101. Then below, we can just plant the numbers as they are. Our P is 0 0.06, our T 0 0.015, stress T 150 by 10 power six. All of them put together, multiply by 100%. Then you get 43.98% as our answer. So here you notice that depending on how information has been provided, get your values one by one and then do your analysis. Get the one which is the least of them. And that's the one which we're considering to be the maximum allowable force. And then from there, you can now calculate your efficiency. Again, as per tradition, there's an exercise there. You can try out and see how the answers are coming out. Feel free to drop a comment. Let me know where you feel there's some emphasis needed or something you could have observed. The next one we'll look at will be the welded joints, the welded joints.